In this video, we're going to discuss a little bit about permutation approaches to hypothesis testing. We're also going to talk a little bit about when or why we might prefer to use an approach like this. To do so, we're going to work with this simplified example here. This is looking at the weights of chicks on one of two different diets and the weight after six weeks. So um, here we have just a simplified data set of only nine observations. Um, we have the full data set that we'll look at later as well as we'll look at implementing all of the concepts we discuss in this video using the statistical software R. So I've kept the example here simple so that we can see everything on the screen and easily work through the concepts. So you'll recall that the basic elements of a hypothesis test are always the same, regardless of the approach, whether it's parametric, non-parametric, um, resampling or reshuffling type approaches. Okay, the general elements are always the same. And so the elements we're looking at, the first thing we want to do is specify a null and an alternative hypothesis. And an important reminder that we work with assuming the null hypothesis to be true. The second important element is that we need to choose a test statistic. Right. And again, these in some way compare what do we observe in our sample of data to what would we expect if the null hypothesis was true. And in our, um, our example here, we're going to look at comparing two different test statistics. The third element is we determine the distribution of the test statistic, again, under the null. If the null hypothesis is true, what's the distribution of all the test statistics we could end up with? And then the fourth is that we convert our test statistic into a p-value. Again, which generally tells us what's the probability of, of observing what we did in our sample or something even more extreme if the null hypothesis were true. Okay, so here, the question we want to get at is, do these two diets differ? Okay, is the weight gain under one different than the other? Okay, and there's lots of ways we can try and get at this, and we need to be a bit more specific about what do we mean by differ. Do we mean, um, are we comparing the mean weights under the two diets, or the median weights, or maybe we want to just compare the lower tail of the distribution, say the 10th percentile. So at the lower end, the really light um, chickens, you know, is the 10th percentile much higher for one feed type than the other? Right? So maybe we want to just make sure, are we pulling up that lower tail of the distribution for one diet compared to the other? And so. Um, comparing the mean under these two diets, we can use large sample approaches like the two-sample t-test, which has been explored. Um, we can do non-parametric approaches like the Wilcoxon rank sum, also known as the Mann-Whitney U-test, and this compares the medians under the two. Um, by using other approaches like a permutation approach, okay, or bootstrap approach, which is a related but um, different approach, these allow us to test things more specific other than just comparing means or medians. So let's talk a little bit about why we might choose to use a permutation approach. If our sample size is small and we can't um, use these large sample approaches, that might be one reason for trying a permutation test. Um, if the assumptions are not met, um, as noted, if we want to test something a bit more specific other than comparing means or medians, so if our test statistic, say, is comparing the, the 10th percentile of these two feed types. Okay? Or maybe we want to compare the range of weights for these two feed types. So these other approaches allow us to be um, a bit more specific in the hypothesis we want to test. Um, other reasons, if the test statistic that we're going to work with um, has, is difficult to estimate the standard error for, using approaches like this are going to help us um, work around that. So in our example, we're going to compare the weight gain under these two different feed types. So our null hypothesis, stating it a bit generally, is that is going to be that the weight gain is the same under both diets. Under both diets or both feed types. 
For test statistics, we're going to consider two different ones just so we can look at comparing um, absolute difference in means as well as comparing absolute difference in medians. So the first test statistic we're going to look at, and I'm just going to abbreviate it TS so that we can save ourselves some writing room and the screen doesn't get too crowded. So test statistic number one, we're going to look at the absolute difference in the mean weight under casein minus the mean weight under meat meal. And the second test statistic we'll also consider, I'm going to abbreviate TS number two, is going to be the absolute difference in the median under casein minus the median under meat meal. And again, I'm throwing a hat on top here to, uh, to represent that they're sample estimates. If we were to work this out for our observed data here, we'd find that test statistic number one is going to be the um, absolute difference in means. The mean for casein, right, the mean of these four here, is going to come out to be 349.25. And the mean for meat meal comes out to be 316. The absolute difference is 33.25. And our second test statistic, the median for the first group is 373.5. And the median for the second is 315. The absolute difference, 58.5. Okay, so if our null hypothesis is true, right, if the weight under these two feed types is the same, we'd expect these test statistics to come out to be roughly zero, right? The means should be the same, the medians should be about the same. We know they're not going to be exactly the same, right? It's a sample, they're going to drift somewhere, um, hopefully close to zero if the null is true. So we want to know how much evidence do these estimates provide against that null? Or in other words, what's the probability of getting test statistics this large or larger if the null is true and we'd expect these to come out to be roughly zero? So we're going to build up to um, getting to this p-value using a permutation um, testing type approach. Okay. So to do this, remember we start by assuming our null hypothesis is true. Okay. And so essentially what we're assuming is that these nine observations here are equally likely to belong to the meat meal or the casein group. Right? That weight is independent of the feed type. Okay? Or that we can state it this way, that these labels are in some sense irrelevant. Okay? This observation of 260 is just as likely to belong to casein as it is to meat meal. Right? The weights and the feed types are independent. So the way we're going to try and get at building up the distribution of test statistics and getting to our p-value is by considering all possible permutations of this data. Okay, and what we mean by that is, as stated, if these observations are equally likely to belong to either feed type, right, if they're independent of feed type, what we can do is considering, consider all the possible orderings of these observations. Okay. So what are all the different orderings of these observations? Each of those will be a unique permutation data set. For each of those orderings, we can work out the test statistic. And then we'll have what are all the possible test statistics we could end up with if our null hypothesis was true, okay? if weight gain is independent of feed type. Now, in reality, there's going to be way too many permutations to actually um, work out. So in just this simple example with nine observations, if we want to consider all the possible permutations, the one that we put in the um, first slot can be any of the nine observations. Okay? Then the next observation can be any of the remaining eight. Then the next can be any of the remaining seven, okay, and so on, all the way down to one. Okay, or nine factorial. And that's going to come out to be 362,880. Okay, in other words, there's about 360,000 different possible orderings of these nine observations. Okay. Now you can imagine we get to a data set with 50 observations, or 100, or 1,000. Okay, considering all possible permutations, isn't going to be possible. Even with high computing power, these things um, explode really quickly. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a um, simulation, okay, or a sample of all the possible permutations. So in other words, we're going to take these observations, we're going to shuffle them up okay, into a random order. That's going to be our permutation data set. Calculate our test statistic. Do that again. Shuffle these around in a different order. And repeat that over and over again to get a bunch of different possible permutations. 
And we can do that by either shuffling these observations here, or you can shuffle the labels around. Okay, I'm going to do it shuffling these nine observations as I, I personally find it a bit clearer to look or think that way. Um, but either way is going to get the same result and it's going to be the exact same conceptually. So let's get to creating a, our first permutation data set. So I'm going to label that permutation number one. Here our first permutation data set. So we can think of out of these nine, we're going to randomly select one to be our first observation. Suppose it comes out to be 303. Okay. Now we're sampling um, without replacement, meaning that observation does not go back in the pool. Right? We want to look at all the possible orderings of these. The second observation I randomly select, suppose it comes out to be 379. Okay. Then select the third, 260. The next is 380. 325, 390, 368, 315, and 257. Right. So this is one of the possible reorderings of these nine observations. Now for this permutation data set, let's go through and calculate the test statistic number one and test statistic number two. So first, I'll put down test stat number one and I'm just going to put a subscript P1 here to indicate this is from our first permutation data set. If we calculate the mean of the casein group, it's going to come out to 332.5, and the mean of the meat meal, 329.4, and the absolute difference, 3.1. If we calculate the second test statistic, and again, I'm going to put a like a superscript here, P1, to indicate it's from the first permutation. The median for the first group is 341.5. The median for the second group is 325. And the absolute difference is 16.5. Right. So again, these are giving us an idea. If our null hypothesis is true, if these observations are independent of feed type or equally likely to belong to either feed type, what type of test statistics can show up? Right? We'd expect it to be zero, and these give us some indication of how far they might drift from zero if our null hypothesis is true. Now let's go through and just create a, a second permutation data set. So I'm going to label our second one permutation number two. Okay, and again, let's consider a possible reordering of these. Suppose our first one comes out to 390. Second one's 325, then 303, 380, 260, 379, 257, 315, and 368. Right, so again, this is another possible reordering of these nine observations. If we go through and calculate the test statistics for these, again, I'm going to call it Test statistic number one, and I'm going to put P2 here to indicate it's come from our second permutation data set. If we calculate the mean for the first group, it's 329.75, and the mean for the second group, 331.6, the absolute difference, 1.85. We look at test statistic number two, and the median for the first group comes out to 341.5. The median for the second group comes out to 325. And the absolute difference is 16.5. Okay, so again, this gives us a second idea of what are possible values the test statistics could take on if the null hypothesis were true. So what we're going to do is we're going to go through and we're going to repeat this p times, okay, p permutations. So permutation number p. Okay. In reality, um, there's no limit to the number of times or number of permutations you can take. The suggestion or the a rough guideline is at least 10,000 or more. The only real limitation is computing power and how long it takes to run through these things. Um, an important note is that increasing p, the number of permutations you run through, does not increase the amount of information in the data. Okay, we only have nine observations. Having more permutations doesn't create more information. Then 
what we're going to do is, um, well, determine the distribution of the test statistic. That's going to be looking at the distribution okay, of all these test statistics, permutation test statistics we have here. Right? If we looked at it, say, a histogram of all the test statistic number one from our permutation sets, okay, this is going to give us our estimate of the sampling distribution right, under the null. Then what we go through is work our way to a p-value. And what the p-value is, is we're going to look at the number of times the permutation test statistic was greater than the observed test statistic. All that divided by p, the number of permutations we've run through. Okay, so in this kind of just simple demonstration here of running through two permutations, if we look at test statistic number one, we observed a test statistic of 33.25. In our um, permutation test statistics, we ended up with 3.1 and 1.85. Okay, so we actually didn't end up with any permutation test statistics larger than our observed test statistic. Okay, so in this case of two, our p-value um, here would come out to be zero. Okay, we're going to actually run through more than two permutations, but this is the concept of how we get at that p-value. Right? So a reminder, a p-value is trying to get at the idea of what's the probability of getting what we got in our sample, right? what we observed in our sample, or something even more extreme if the null is true. Right? If the null is true, and we'd expect something like this. Um, it's worth noting one kind of drawback or one limitation of a permutation type approach is that we actually cannot build a confidence interval through this approach. It only allows us to test hypotheses. So what we're going to get into is looking at the full data set and implementing this concept, running through a permutation test um, for test statistic one and test statistic number two using the statistical software R. Subscribe to our channel, share our videos. Stick around guys, because we got a lot more. Thanks for watching our video. I want you to have a nice time.